what's cracking big big dogs welcome bike to the channel welcome bike to the headquarters this is bdge bdge we are repping the set today i never thought i'd become one of those guys that only just wears their own shit all the time but lo and behold here thou art my name is nicholas this is big dogs got e fantasy football today we are getting risque Risque. Here's the thing, people. For the most part, you can't win your fantasy league within the first few picks, but you can certainly lose it. Like, of course, you could win your fantasy league in the first few picks. Like last year, if you took Christian McCaffrey, literally no one else had a chance to win their league. So for 11 people, you didn't have a chance to win your league in the early round. You can certainly lose it. So as I've become a better fantasy player over the years, I think one of the key takeaways or one of the key strategies that has got me there to become a better fantasy player overall that y'all should take away is you should start to be a little bit more risk averse in the earlier rounds of drafts because you've got to remember there's a reason these early guys are going early because they're going to be putting up a lot of points week over week they've got to be the core of your team they've got to be the ones you know your first round picks got to be putting up 16 to 17 a game your second round picks got to be putting up 13 to 14 a game so on and so forth so the earlier picks have got to hit just to keep you in the running, just to keep you in that playoff sniffing area. The later you get in drafts, I usually mess around maybe round five ish, round six ish is where I start to look for straight upside because those guys aren't going to be counted on to be the core of your team. Round five, round six, they probably are, but y'all get the overall arching point. If you miss on your first round pick, if you miss on your second round pick, and they bottom out for any number of reasons you are in a massive hole because everybody else probably played it a little bit safer thus they have those 12 14 17 22 point guys rolling in week over week so today we are going to be looking at the riskiest early round running backs these are guys going within the first three rounds of fantasy drafts these aren't guys that i dislike necessarily these are guys that i think we all objectively have to acknowledge have some red flags with them and thus make them probably a little bit of a worse pick than the guys going around them so this adp is brought to you by ffpc these are high stakes leagues so i'm taking the adp from there so the top three rounds the early round riskiest running backs in 2020 fantasy football let's tuck our shirts in let's stop yelling Let's eat. I think the easiest and most obvious one to acknowledge off the rip is Dalvin Cook, currently going off the board at the 106 as the RB5. Last year, you got everything that you wanted from Cook. Everything about upside, everything about workhorse ability, everything about everything you got from Dalvin Cook if you drafted him last year. All of the red flags floated away for the most part. But the chances of that happening again in 2020 are slim. You've got to pick him with a top seven pick. He's your RB1. He is your salvation. He is leading you to the promised land if you are taking him in 2020 fantasy football drafts. But there's a couple red flags here with Dalvin Cook. One, we've got the contract talks. I have no idea what this holdout is going to lead to. I know a lot of people are like, oh, he's got no leverage because of CBA. And then other people are like, well, you didn't read the CBA. He actually does have leverage, et cetera, et cetera. None of us know what the fuck's going on. None of us know what's going on inside of Dalvin Cook's head. None of us know about the experience that his agent has with contract talks and holdouts and that kind of shit. So you don't know what's going on. So anything about leverage and shit, I don't believe what YouTube comments are about to tell me in the comment section. I love the comments that you guys leave me, but most of the time you're just projecting and you have no idea what you're actually talking about. Neither do i on the situation and that's what makes it fucking risky none of us have any idea what we're talking about contract talks does he hold out they re-sign amir abdullah they have alexander madison they have mike boone do they roll out that three running back committee knowing that they don't need dalvin cook it's a possibility unlikely sure but still a possibility the other thing here and someone brought this up in discord and we'll talk about it a little bit more on fade the public video tomorrow as well and i have no idea if this will actually work or not but with the corona settlements coming into play nfl pa and the owners and whatever starting to get more and more in agreement they're obviously going to have an opt-out clause i don't know what this necessarily entangles 
what the contract means. Like if you opt out, are you just not getting paid whatsoever? I mean, that would make sense a little bit. Maybe it's unfair to just not play, not pay these players at all if they want to opt out because of the, the safety of their family, safety or whatever. Maybe someone can comment on this. But someone commented on the disc in the Discord channel that we have for big dogs. Do you think Dalvin Cook could use this as a leverage point? You know, the holdout can be used as a way to opt out of the season from Corona and be like, listen, Minnesota, I'm opting out because I'm worried about the safety of my team. And again, I don't know how the payment works out. So it's possible that if he does that, he's got no leverage because they don't actually have to pay him if he opts out. But if there is some kind of payment, maybe he opts out for safety reasons while actually holding out so i don't know if that's a real thing but it's a possibility i think you need to be concerned about and the real concern here is obviously the injury history of dalvin cook he missed 12 games his rookie year five his second season and last year obviously if you were in the playoffs that shit hurted a little bit so he has not played a full season yet and as you can see here from the beautiful screenshot of player profiler they have free injury probability medical history fragility rating at the bottom of every profile page on playerprofiler.com it is a free beautiful 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 resource they are just donating information to fantasy players to help put more context behind injuries one of the most underrated pieces of fantasy analysis go over to playerprofiler.com type in dalvin cook in the player search scroll all the way to the bottom and his injury history will be here as you can see he is ranked number 12 in terms of injury probabilities fragility rating is actually only 26 so maybe they're not as nervous about dalvin cook as some of us might be when we don't put context behind the injuries and when we talk to dr morse he goes into extensive detail in injuries in the uh, big dogs draft guide which you could see up there as well as just some of the videos that i've done with him and, and talked to him behind the scenes he has dalvin cook rated as a five out of ten in terms of injury risk going into next year so it's definitely not a lower case but it's definitely not someone he is avoiding right he doesn't have him rated as a seven and a half or an eight out of ten in terms of guys that you should be avoiding because the injury history is very very severe on sportsinjurypredictor.com which is a partner of dr morse and the fancy doctors they have been projected to miss two games this year so with dalvin cook we have the contract concerns and we have the health concerns the way i'm looking at it is like hat tip to y'all that drafted him last year and reaped the benefits of it but i don't know if it's wise to double down again in 2020 i think there's a good chance that all these red flags end up pushing cook into the second round of drafts right we don't know when the if you're drafting today you shouldn't feel good about taking dalvin cook with your first pick because we have no idea what's going to happen with the contract talks and as we've seen previous few years like these holdouts are very real and players will hold out if they think they need a bigger contract if he drops into the second round i think he's absolutely worth pursuing just given the upside that he has he could be a top three running back if you were to forgo all of these red flags that basically did last year but again i mean i think it, it would be unwise to assume that he is not a risque pick in the first round of fantasy drafts this year Let's move to the second player on this list. We're going to do five running backs today. The second player on this list is Kenyon Drake of the Arizona Cardinals. Kenyon Drake is rapidly moving up draft boards. Right now, he is the RB10 going off the board at the 201, so the first pick of the second round. So the big question is, how does Arizona use him in 2020? Is he built to sustain the workhorse volume that people assume Arizona is going to give him. Drake is fun because a lot of people liked his talent for a long time. Coming out of Alabama, his time in Miami, we just never thought he got the volume that he deserved. For those people that have been touting him for like 17 years, y'all finally got that injection of dopamine last year when he got traded to the Arizona Cardinals. Dude exploded in his first game against a very stout 49ers front, pops off for 162 total yards and a tug on 19 touches. That was followed by four like more or less dud games. Then he pops off for a ridiculous four touchdown game against Cleveland, 184 yards, two touchdowns against, I believe it was Seattle in weeks 15, 16, ends a, ends a year with a mediocre game against the Rams, I believe. So it was an up and down season once he got to Arizona. There are a multitude of concerns I have with Drake. The first red flag I have with Drake is, is one that I don't think anyone necessarily talks about. And this is definitely going to be going against the grain because everyone loves Drake's talent. But I think there's a bigger conversation to be had here. And it's about advanced metrics overall, especially within the fantasy community, right? The community is kind of developing really, really quickly at a rapid pace with so many people that are good with Excel and people that are good with way fucking better number crunchers than myself here right i consider myself a middleman i find the best information out there i find the most predictive information the most advanced metrics and i try to feed them to y'all advanced metrics is a way of looking at fantasy players outside of just the box score advanced metrics kind of personalize each fantasy player's 
numbers and they tell you how good a player is regardless of the teammates around them and what it does is in the long term in the long run when you're trying to predict how good a player is going to be statistically it helps improve the probability or possibility of you predicting a player's outcome correctly if that makes sense what i wanted to look at with drake and, and i talked about this already with dalvin cook on player profiler they are they give away a ton of advanced metrics they literally i mean i've talked to matt about this they literally hire dudes to come in and watch games play by play and dissect how a player did on each play and fucking throw them into a blender, make a cocktail of advanced metrics and throw it on their page absolutely free. So some of the best metrics when it comes to advanced metrics, isolate a player's performance from their supporting cast in different game situations. I always look at these when, I, when it comes to running backs because I need to know, is it just a volume thing? Was it just the situation? Because if that's the case for a lot of players, you cannot predict success year over year based on things that running backs themselves can't control. If you're a great running back, if you're able to make a lot of guys miss, if you're able to make your team better, Better, then you're probably going to have success wherever you are. However, if you are just fed volume, if you can't make guys miss, if you're not elusive, if you're not a tackle breaker, if you're not a chain mover, then as soon as the supporting cast comes down around you, you are going to suffer as well. So when we look at Kenyon Drake, he was great for fantasy, great for fantasy last year, but he wasn't that good as an actual running back, despite some of the flashy plays that you guys saw on TV. His breakaway run rate was 25th in the NFL. For someone so explosive, that number should be higher. His evaded tackles per attempt ranked 49th among running backs. His yards created per carry were 49th among running backs. And the most wild stat on this page right here, and they separate for each running back based on, you know, not just, you can look at football outsiders, you can look at pro football focus, and it'll tell you the overall run blocking success of a team, but player profile actually breaks it down to when that runner was on the field and when he was running the ball, how good was the run blocking rate or the execution of that offensive line. Kenyon Drake enjoyed the fourth best run blocking efficiency in the entirety of the NFL last year at the running back position. The Cardinals are fucking terrible up front and somehow he enjoyed the fourth best run blocking efficiency rate last year. Again, this is telling you how good Kenyon Drake was without the supporting cast. His offensive line played really, really well when he was on the field for him. He did not play well. Again, I'm going to repeat those stats. 49th in evaded tackles per attempt, 49th in yards created per carry, 25th in breakaway run rate. So when you look at these advanced metrics, the ones for Kenyon Drake are particularly interesting because he's such a polarizing player this offseason. People say that he's an incredible running back and he's explosive and he's talented. But when he's asked to gain yards on his own without the offensive line being that good, which you're not going to get again, that was just a lucky thing for him. He was actually a very, very, very poor performer as a running back. And that stuff tends to play itself out over the long run. When you're investing into these higher players, these higher ranked players, these higher draft capital players, this is a part of risk I think you need to factor in. You want to know that the guy you're drafting in the first round, in the early second round, is actually a star and he's going to produce regardless of what is put on the field around him. And I'm actually nervous about that for Kenyon Drake. This is the same shit I said about David Johnson last year and he was horrible running the ball. I'm like, yo, he's yards created per touch, evaded tackles per touch. He was like 45th, 50th. And then he goes into last season. I've been saying this for years and you go into last season and he was horrible on the ground. Yes, I understood he caught a lot of passes and he's still good in the receiving game because he's a wide receiver running back. But these are things you have to think of. That is concern number one. Concern number two for Kenyon Drake, of course, is, I, is that we've never seen him do it over the course of a full season. Four years at Alabama, never more than 106 touches in a season. He comes into the NFL three years in Miami, maxed out at 173 touches. Now, I will say, again, these are not guys that I just don't like. I want to give both sides of the story here. For Kenyon Drake, it is encouraging to see that Arizona pays him this tag of $8.4 million. That says a lot. They trade for him in season. They really like this dude. And then they did not address the running back position in the offseason outside of a seventh round pick in Eno Benjamin while getting rid of David Johnson gladly. So no free agent. And objectively, yes, we like Eno Benjamin, but he is a seventh round rookie pick. So the competition for Kenyon Drake, if he could stay on the field and they're going to give him and touches is lackluster at best. It's also worth noting how they transitioned over the second half of the year. Once Drake was there, once Drake took over, 
Kenyon Drake arrived in Arizona in week nine. From that point through the end of the season, Kyler Murray ranked 27th among quarterbacks in pass attempts per game. Alex, great follow-up question, sir. Was it a big drop-off? Where did he rank prior to Drake's arrival? He was sixth in the NFL in pass attempts per game prior to Drake, so a massive drop-off. They did bring in Hopkins, so it's possible that this offense goes more pass-heavy. They have a lot more flexibility to work with, and Cliff Kingsbury is a guy that's good with flexibility and can run an offense properly, as you saw him change the offense as the year went on. That's something Something that he will be able to do and adapt to as the years go on. So overall, my biggest concern is, is Kenyon Drake actually a good workhorse running back or does he just do everything at a good, if not above average level? And if so, can that play itself out over the course of the season? If he's not getting 300 touches, is he going to be able to produce? If he's only getting 220 touches, are we really about to draft him with the 13th overall pick in fantasy? Mm, I don't know, y'all. It is risque. Let's head over to another running back that will be sporting red this season. That is Clyde Edwards Hilaire, the Kansas City Chiefs, currently going off the board as the RB14 at the 211. So still a second round pick. I was as high as anyone on CEH, and I've talked about this multiple times in previous videos, so I'm not going to harp on this. But the fact of the matter is that when there's smoke, there is fire. We are hearing nothing but reports about Damian Williams in Kansas City. Damian Williams will remain the starter, but first round rookie pick Clyde Edwards Hilaire will compete for playing time. Chiefs running backs coach Delane McC I have no idea how to say that. Expects a big jump from Damian Williams this season. So they wouldn't just be talking shit because last summer they talked about Damian Williams being the featured back. This summer, if they believed that Clyde Edwards Hilaire was going to be the featured back, they would say so because they already did that for Damian Williams last year. Again, this summer is going to be filled. No preseason game, which means an even slower start for these redraft rookies. I mean, the, the reason we're nervous about all these other rookies, Jonathan Taylor, you got Marlon Mack and Naeem Hines competing with him. J.K. Dobbins, he's got Mark Ingram competing with him. DeAndre Swift, he's got Karyon Johnson repeating with him. We got Cam Akers, and apparently he's got actually, he went from somehow the least competition to the most competition because Sean McVay is talking about a four running back committee. I don't even think a guy like John Kelly has had more than four carries in his career. So whatever Sean McVay is smoking, I would love some of it this weekend. All these guys are competing with with other players in their respective offenses. So the same thing needs to be said with Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I understand this is a high powered offense and I think Clyde will end up having a very good fantasy season, but not acknowledging the fact that you might be picking a running back by committee, a guy in a committee in the second round, I think would be irresponsible. And again, it's possible that this is just coach speak from Kansas City, but I mean, Damian Williams, man, look at this stat. Damian Williams fantasy points, half PPR, dating back to 2018 in games where he saw 14 or more touches. Now, I don't expect him to get 14 or more touches typically, but anytime Kansas City gave him the workload, look at these fantasy point numbers, 27.3, 21.5, 23.9, 30.1, 15.5, 19.8, 11.1, 12.1, 13.1, 14.1, 15.1, 16.1, 27.3. This includes playoff. And yes, this is absolutely real. Does Clyde Edwards Hilaire have the upside of getting 17 to 18 touches and scoring double digit touchdowns? Absolutely. But not if they're going to force this into a committee. And again, Damian Williams has performed very, 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 very well for this team when given the opportunity. So they, I, I don't think it's coach speak. I think they really do like this kid and Damian Williams. Let's move into round three. James Conner, Pittsburgh Steelers, current ADP, RB15 at the 302. He has moved up pretty drastically. But again, guys, these are high stakes ADPs. I ain't making this shit up. I have seen James Conner go a lot later in drafts in the third round, but some people are going to get higher. I, I can imagine he's a guy who will continually rise up draft board as the summer goes by. The best way I could put it is his injury risk is similar to Snacks' running the 40. It's it's inevitable. Did you talk? Oh, I can't go. 
<laughs> Why do you keep falling? <laughs> He has the single highest injury probability on playerprofiler.com amongst all running backs. Fragility rating at number eight. The guy stays on the field like Animal stays on McDoubles. Dr. Morse rated him a 7.5 out of 10 in terms of injury concern going into 2020. Injury from player profiler. You're looking at injury risk from Dr. Morse. You're looking at injury risk from sports injury predictor. I don't need to tell you that James Conner is fragile. Gile. I also think there's like other concerns to be had here with James Conner. I don't think he's a particularly good running back. Again, going back to the advanced metrics with James Conner, he was never a guy who was elusive. He's not a tackle breaker. He does everything well, nothing great. And I know he had, what was it, like 71 targets or whatever in 2018. He was basically the Carlos Hyde of 2018 when Carlos Hyde was in the San Francisco offense and got like 85 targets that year. Was not good with him, just happened to be the right place, the right time. There's no way Pittsburgh is going to use him in that same realm in the passing game as they did last year. They bring in Anthony McFarlane. I talked a lot about run AMC. Like I said, he's putting on a movie every time he's on the field. That's why his nickname is AMC Anthony McFarlane. Their fourth round rookie pick, explosive as hell. He's going to get on the field. He's going to make some plays. We don't know what we're going to get from this offense either. I know Big Ben was hurt, but is there any guarantee that Big Ben is going to be healthy this year? He's coming off serious injuries. He's getting up there in age. I also think this O-line is starting to decline a little bit. I don't think they're going to be a bad offensive line. I think they're declining in the run blocking category. They got worse when I was looking at a lot of the advanced metrics. They're still good pass blocking, but the run blocking is going to be a little bit of a concern this year. So I just think there are a ton of red flags. There's no way I'm touching James Conner in the third round. If he starts to drop to the late fourth round, early fifth round, that's where I'll be eyeing him. But given all the red flags that James Conner has, it is ugly. We've got our fifth and final running back coming up. One, if you're enjoying the video, if you're finding it informational, if you're finding it valuable, make sure you hit the thumbs up and I could do more videos like this. Maybe I'll do one for the wide receiver category. Maybe I'll do one for the later round running backs, et cetera, et cetera. So hit the button that looks like this. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're doing tons of fantasy football goodness throughout the rest of the summer as well as in season but we talked a lot about these advanced metrics we talked a lot about the injuries going on within these players which i think is crucial to put context behind all of these things the best work that i do is in the draft guide that we put together basically if you don't got time to watch 30 minute videos every single day on youtube which who the fuck's got time for that in this economy i put all of my best work i put all the best stuff my best research all neatly organized compact for y'all in the draft guide, which includes the top sleepers and overvalued players, undervalued players. It includes the entire all fade list, the guys you should not be drafting at any price this year. It includes the rankings, obviously, the top 250 big board and PPR, half PPR standard. We got our dynasty rankings in there. We've got a ton of exclusive articles. We're going to start doing pushing out uh, exclusive videos every Friday as well going forward that you will not find on YouTube. And of course, we've talked about Dr. Morse's injury guide, his, in, his full breakdown injury guide. He's got video profiles. He's got write-ups. He's got the injury scores, one to 10 score, basically just a quick hitter if you don't want to read everything or watch everything of how injury prone a player is going to be going into 2020. There's just so much fucking value jam-packed into this draft guide that it doesn't make sense not to get it for literally fucking ten dollars you go to monkeyknifefight.com you deposit ten dollars using the promo code bdge and you play a game on there for two dollars or more you're going to get 25 dollars to play with when you put ten dollars in they match your deposit bonus they 100 percent match it so if you put 25 in they're going to give you 50 if you put 50 in they're going to give you 100 to play with plus the five free dollars to play with i don't know why the fuck they put that on top of it but they did so 25 dollars to play with for you plus you get all of our draft guides absolutely free with that ten dollar deposit when you use the promo code bdg once you play a game within 24 hours, I will personally email y'all access and instructions on how to get the draft guide. If it's been 24 hours, just make sure you check your spam folder. If it's been 27 hours, maybe I'm hungover and I haven't gotten to it yet, but y'all can shoot me an email if so. MonkeyKnifeFight.com, promo code BDGE when you deposit 10 bucks. If you're in a state that's not eligible for Monkey Knife Fight, you can go grab it at Big Dog's Draft Guide. 
Ticketmaster.com. Running back number five. Y'all thought I was going to get through this video without talking about Todd Gurley. The ugliest third round pick of them all. Running back 16 at the 304. This is just a pick I won't get behind. He could finish as the RB2 this year overall. And I will still stick to what I'm talking about right now. I understand that Todd Gurley played in 15 games last year. 15 games despite all the injury buzz about his knee going into 2019. But there's a reason that he played on 70% of the Rams snaps last year after playing on nearly 85 to 90% in the previous two years. It is that knee. It is that arthritis. There is no reason for him having not to have played at the level that he did the previous two years unless he was injured. Gurley had never particularly been an explosive back in the NFL, but he looked like a slug. Not a shell of himself, a slug of himself last year. The 12 rushing touchdowns were the only thing that kept him fantasy relevant in 2019. Anything efficiency-wise was brutal. We're going to go back to player profile and their advanced metrics. Breakaway run rate, 2.7%. So the percentage of runs that went for 15-plus yards, 42nd in the NFL. Juke rate, so basically his elusive rating, 40th in the NFL. Production premium, 50th. Yards created per touch, 60 Eighth. Again, all of these are completely free advanced analytics available to you on playerprofiler.com. His elusive rating per PFF, 28th among running backs. Yards after contact per attempt, 36. So he's not explosive after he gets hit either. Sure, we could chalk it up to bad offensive line play in LA. I guess, yeah, whatever. But Gurley was terrible in his own right. And guess what? Y'all talk about, oh, he's going to Atlanta. This is a good up and coming offense with a great up. Bitch, I'm an Atlanta fan. Our offensive line fucking stinks. We drafted two first round offensive linemen last year. One of them played like five games. The other one was fucking terrible. Just because you pick somebody in the first round. One of them at the very, very end of the first round. So I don't even know if it counts as a first round pick. Technically it does. But that doesn't mean they're a hit. That doesn't mean your offensive line is going to be awesome just because you selected guys. Last year, we ranked 24th in run blocking per football outsider. Just because he's moving to Atlanta doesn't mean he's moving to a good offensive line. And Gurley's knee is still very much an issue, man. I will make this point video after video talking about Gurley. They gave him a one-year, $5 million deal. He is a 25-year-old running back. If they thought he had anything left in the tank, why not give him two to three years? 25 years old ain't 29 years old, ain't 28 years old. That is like 30-year-old money about a guy who's completely washed up. 25 years old, he's getting a one-year, $5 million contract. That should tell you what the Falcons think about him. The team came out and said they don't even know about the knee. Literally after they signed him, after watching him play 15 games last year, Dirk Cutter's a moron. I know that. But this was a whole nother le- a whole nother level of documenting my journey to becoming not an Atlanta Falcons fan anymore. Literally came out the main question that no one seems to know is what is his health status? How are you gonna fucking sign a guy and not know his health status? What are you talking about, Dirk Cutter? Uh and then you look back at the injury probability rating of player profile, injury probability, number four overall. I know everyone is just so excited about Gurley stepping into Devonta Freeman's role. Devonta Freeman was just completely buoyed by garbage time receiving numbers. And most of that buoyed by the four receiving touchdowns that he had. Guess what? He had three total receiving touchdowns in the three years prior. Like, were you happy with Devonta Freeman the last couple? You're talking about, oh, Devonta Freeman is going to step right into that role. What the fuck did you do with Devonta Freeman in your fantasy team last year? He was a horrible pick. He didn't do shit for you. Maybe two games he got lucky that you put him into your lineup. I'm sorry, Gurley might see like 50 plus targets this year, but he's not explosive enough to do anything close to using those targets to get you to a quality fantasy number. Homies, you're going to be disappointed if you draft Todd Gurley this year. I understand he's got no comp. This was supposed to be a completely unbiased video, just laying out the risks and the pros and the cons and all that shit. But f- Todd Gurley and f- the Atlanta Falcons. I don't mean that. I'm just mad, baby. I'm scared. I'm scared of being a nobody here. Just, just, just please don't draft Todd Gurley in the second round. Don't draft him in the third round. If you're going to do it, if you're going to break my fucking heart, do it in the fourth round or the fifth round. I don't know how he's not going to get the workload, but somehow he will be sharing this backfield. And when he's on the field, he's going to be behind a bad offensive line. And he just doesn't have any sort of explosion to get shit done Uh, i'm done i'm done i'm sorry i'm gonna go off the rails and i can't stop yelling i can't stop yelling and i try not to yell in these fantasy videos but todd Gurley's got me on a whole nother motherfucking level today that's all i gotta say about these risky early round running backs there are other guys but again they do not fall into the top three rounds maybe i'll do another video let me know in the comment section what kind of videos you would like to see going forward 
give me something with some nice clickbait. I need I'm, I need to start popping off for like 50k, 100k video views over here. And the way I do that is by y'all hitting the thumbs up button, so it lets YouTube know that it's good and it shows them to other people and etc. 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 That's all I got for y'all today. So do make sure you hit the thumbs up. Do make sure you leave a rating and review if you're listening via podcast on iTunes. Make sure you subscribe if you're on YouTube. Most of all, if you're going to support the brand, please do it through monkeyknifefight.com by using the promo code BDGE when you deposit 10 bucks. And make sure you go check out them advanced analytics metrics via playerprofiler.com. That's all I got for y'all today. I love you and I'll see you on Fade the Public tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll hate you tomorrow. Top girly is really trash. Bye.